I want to begin today's program by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the homeland of the Salish Kelis Bay people at a place they called Timsum Klee. Their example as the original stewards of this land guides our work today. Travelers Rest Connection is committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through the ancient crossroads on this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations, and we invite you to learn from and support them as well. I want to say a quick thank you to everyone who makes these programs possible. First and foremost, the members of Travelers Rest Connection. Without your support, nothing is possible here. Um, Humanities Montana, MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, who provided a media assistance grant to record Saturday storytelling each week this winter, and Hunter Bay Coffee. Um, due to the ice, we do have a lot of folks on Zoom today, so um, we're going to do our best to make sure that we can see and hear everything. Um, if you have questions for our panel, please type them into the chat box on Zoom. And our amazing VISTA member, Galen, in the corner over there, um, is going to try to monitor the chat for questions and troubleshoot technical issues while we're speaking today. And now, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. You must, must be much taller than I am. Um, I, could do, I could do a little adjustment there. but Since 1991, the Backroads crew has traveled across Montana, visiting its unique people and places. John Twiggs took over the reins as host last year when William Marcus retired after 30 years and 50 episodes. Holy moly. Um, additional producers and our guests today include Ray Eknes and Gus Chambers. Not with us today, but um, essential members of the crew are Anna Rao and Brianna McCabe. Backroads of Montana is produced for Montana PBS through the University of Montana Broadcast Media Center. We're so fortunate to have the team here today to tell us some of the backstories from the back roads, and I'll let them speak for themselves. Can you hear me OK? I, I think the plan we worked out here is that this is going to be sort of like a back roads meeting, where we will just kind of not accomplish a lot. <laughs> <laughs> where we will, uh, you know, have some snappy patter and banter back and forth. But I'm William Marcus, the host of Backroads, starting in 91 and ending in 2001, after 30 years and 50 shows. And I've never been into numerology, but it seemed that 50 and 30 seemed like a good time to hand off the show. Primarily because I wanted to make sure, we all wanted to make sure that it would go on. And we had to establish a new host, a new team, and John is now the uh, host of the show. And I'll turn it over to him to talk about the transition and how that went for him. And whether he has started to be stopped at Costco by people saying, Where's the old guy? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, John, why don't you uh, fill him in on what's going on now? Well, well, I mean, I'll pick it up from what. So, as uh, as you can tell, with, with this group, it's either retirement or near retirement. <laughs> so, the discussion came up as we got towards the end of William's tenure: was, do you continue the series? Do you just call it good? Some people voted for that. Uh, I wanted to retire the show. <laughs> uh, and we kind of went back and forth about that, but I think in the end where we landed and outvoted Gus was uh, that, that people enjoy the show, they enjoy the series, they enjoy uh, seeing the state, and, and it would be great if we could continue it. And, and for us, of course, it's just a, it's a treat to get to work on it. And so I was excited that we would get to continue doing stories. So, so we talked about that, and I know Ray weighed in on that as well. Yeah, it was, you know, there's still so many stories to tell. We have so many things that we get story ideas from folks. So it's always a great, uh, you know, chance for us to get out and meet people. Oh, I need to get closer, sorry. It, it's great for us to get out and meet people, but it's also great for, uh, you know, all of the folks who watch the program to send in the new ideas. And uh, it's not just, uh, you know, 
stories from western Montana, it's stories from eastern Montana, from north, from the south, um, and it's really fun for us to get around the state. You know, one thing that um, I think the, one of the bigger changes now is that I really never went on the road all that much. Uh, there was this illusion that I went to every place and you know, wrote all these stories because what? it was in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I took credit for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, John and, and Ray and Gus have been the producers and now Brianna and Anna who travel the state, spend time with people, write the stories um, that I had the pleasure of, of reading. Uh, on camera, but now John as host is also someone who travels, and I think that'll make even a more concrete connection between the people in the stories and the host of the show. So. And if you wanted those tips about where you should not stay, <laughs> <laughs> or where to eat, or not eat, yeah. Which, the, which place is, really has fresh sheets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those, can, would, those would be the stories. Are you going to talk about Terry? <laughs> <laughs> I was. I didn't get a chance to tell you. I've gotten an update. They have refurbished oh, really? there. So oh. it kind of takes the sting out of what I would rank as the absolute worst place we ever stayed. But we'll talk, talk about that later. <laughs> I used to describe it. Maybe I shouldn't do any names. But I would describe people go, like, what was it like there? And I go, you know how you check into an older motel and and the bed sags in the middle. This is like that, only it's the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the bed did do it too. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then that shower where it would just sort of trickle out. <laughs> that soft eastern Montana water and about 30 minutes later, he sort of had some stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree to go if there was room service. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's not present for many of these <laughs> stories for that. So those were the nicer trips when yes. William went. <laughs> should we show a video? I think we yes, should. Yes, we should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, want to start? I'll introduce, yes. Okay. Excuse me. I'll get this one ready. Right. So we're going to show four pieces, one from each of us. Um, I began as a radio producer for Montana Public Radio and still do that occasionally, but Are I they? Hello? You and Stereo. Oh. <laughs> but I had done a piece on Gene Robel from Hamilton for All Things Considered. And I thought that there was, she had so much visual stuff, uh, I thought that it would make a great back road story. So th there's a huge difference between writing for radio and, and writing for television, because in television you have the pictures, you don't have to describe them. So it was a difficult transition for me to go from writing for radio to writing for television. I got a lot of help from Ray, who edited this piece together. But Gene was special to uh, a lot of folks, especially to young jazz musicians. Um, the Big Sky Mudflaps, you know, she mentored them and others. Played at the Red Lion in Missoula for decades, driving from Hamilton to Missoula. She'll talk about that. This piece is no longer on the air. I think the first 20 shows are no longer being broadcast. They're online, you can look at them there. So I thought it'd be nice to have another look at Jean Robel and her story. <coughs> story is about a woman who's a genuine Montana gem. Her effervescent personality and polished professionalism make her the jewel of the Bitterroot Valley. Jean Robel has been in love with the piano since she was five years old. Her early playing was part imitation and part frustration with formal lessons that required her to read notes on a page. Then I um, decided I wanted to take lessons from a lady who played in a dance band. So I took lessons from her off of high school, and she taught me how to. And then, uh, that's what I learned. And that's, now what is it that they call stride piano? 
Jean was instantly taken by the sound. She sought out live performances by jazz musicians. Lots of big bands were touring the country then, and she'd go to Missoula with her friends. Oh, we don't go crazy. And I watched those guys, and I, I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to play the piano. Her parents sent her to Portland for lessons, but by now she had heard the sound of a jazz pianist who spoke directly to her heart. His name was Teddy Wilson, a member of the Benny Goodman Trio. Gene had heard him on the radio and had many of his records. So in 1942, she climbed on a train for New York City, hoping to meet her hero. Some friends took her to Cafe Society, the jazz club where Wilson was playing. He came over to our table, we invited him over to our table, and I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, I just don't think I have time to get lessons. So we went back again. And then finally, I think it was like the third time we talked to him, and I can still remember he was holding his head, holding the poor man, and he said, all right. I said, just listen to me play. And then, if you can't give me lessons, I'm going back to Montana. And he said, Montana? I think my wife came from Anaconda. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and soon after, Robel had her first professional gig, playing at a club in Patterson, New Jersey, for $65 a week. She signed with the William Morris Agency as Jean Hamilton, taking her stage name from her hometown. After paying her dues in Patterson, Jean got better dates in Philadelphia, Detroit, and even at the Onyx Club in New York City, where she shared a dressing room with headliner Billie Holiday. She was now making $200 a week, but she was also playing until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and the fast-paced life began to take its toll. She ended up ill and returned home to Hamilton to recuperate. When she returned to New York, a friend suggested she try out for a movie role. The musicians were going to be selected through a radio contest. The broadcasts were heard throughout the country on NBC's Blue Network. You have a great new album. Gene, you play with such a sturdy touch that you might almost give the audience to think you were a man. Well, I get that all the time. But as you can see, I'm all zero. And not even a yard one. <laughs> no. I'm like your dog from the plane of my chair. Well, they picked 10 people, and they, I think I always said, well, they didn't have a piano player, so when I came along, <laughs> they said, okay, you can go. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And for your information that you can't hear, Jean takes off the shoes, beats off the rhythm of the stocking feet, and really enjoys herself. Jean, you're off. The stars of the film, called On Stage, Everybody, included Julie London and Jack Oakey. Universal Pictures sent several of the stars, including Jean, on a publicity tour, performing live in the theaters where the picture was shown. In St. Paul, she met Norm Robel, an RKO theater manager. They were married in January 1946. Jean returned briefly to playing club dates, but the couple soon moved back to Montana. But Jean didn't quit performing. <coughs> She was a fixture for years at Missoula's Red Lion Supper Club, traveling a 100-mile round trip from her home in Hamilton, four days a week, for 35 years. Well, I'll tell you, I, I've done what I wanted to do, and I enjoyed all of it. I wish a lot of times that I would have stuck it out a little longer. Jean Robles' career has been long enough to inspire a whole generation of young musicians who say she's a generous, attentive fan. She tells them to find their own voice in the music, something she says she learned from Teddy Wilson. But I know of somebody that said, what's your greatest wish? <laughs> but, but again, to play 
play just like it. But that isn't what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to play your own thing. That's what music is. That's what makes jazz what it is. And I finally got that in my head. Jean Rowe is still an active performer. You're likely to find her playing at a local tavern in the Bitterroot, or at one of the many private parties that she graces each year. Among the mementos from her career are these. They're some of the checks she wrote to Teddy Wilson for her piano lessons. He cashed this one at Cafe Society. So it's fun to see the various hairstyles and I've had. <laughs> so any questions on the uh, the Gene Robel story or how it came about? Anybody remember Gene? Yeah. Yeah. She was a sweet woman. So right? Okay, so we're gonna uh, show another one. Um, I uh, grew up on uh, the border of Montana and North Dakota, uh, very similar to William. He was on the Montana side, I was on the North Dakota side, and I was much further near Canada than he was. Um, a but precision landing, uh, the, uh, the nice thing about growing up in a small, small town is there's a, a, you learn to appreciate everyone in town, and you learn you know, kind of find out what people are doing. And um, my uncle, uh, pitched horseshoes. And that's where this story came from. Uh, at least got me thinking about it. He's from Westby, Montana. And he would drive down to Culbertson and throw with all of these guys in Northeast Montana. And some of them would go on and win state tournaments and things like that. So I had this in the back of my head for many, many years of uh, going and, and, and seeing my uncle practice up, uh, you know, down behind my grandparents' place in Westby. And uh, so I kept that in the back of my head, and I was looking online one time, and I uh, found this group in uh, Avon, Montana, and uh, they would throw horseshoes inside. And that's what got us started this, uh, during the winter, they had one place where they could practice, and this, um, this elderly gentleman, uh, Jack, who, uh, who you're gonna meet in the, in the piece, uh, built this facility because they needed a place to practice, and he wanted all his friends to come, and he has these little tournaments during the winter uh, before they can go outside and compete. So that's how this story came about. And then when you find these stories and you learn about these stories, you learn about the other people who are going to be there. And it just came up that uh, one, of the, one of the couples that were going to come and, and uh, participate in this little tournament um, had lost she had lost her father a couple of years before, and one of the little inside things is you'll find out during the piece here. Um, but that's what we're always looking for. We're looking for kind of a unique story in, in a unique place, sometimes some place we've never been before. But then we want that little twist in the story as well. So we'll watch this and then we can talk a little bit after. Another sort is the subject of our first story. In the tiny town of Avon, we watched as friends and families competed at horseshoe. It's the sound every horseshoe pitcher loves to hear. It means the release, the arc, and the weight are just right. Repetition is really the key. Uh, it's a similar throw, yet it's repeated, repeated, and doesn't always work, but uh, yeah, that's the idea. Pitchers at Jack Price's horseshoe pit hope that sound will ring through their ears again and again. Well, uh, the competition and the good people that's in it, you know, really good people. The pit for us is, you know, all that. These good people have traveled to the small town of Avon to compete. Butch White came from Great Falls after a winter pitching in Arizona. I've always played the horseshoes, but I uh, went down to the league and they were having a good time and I decided to try tournaments. And I enjoy, enjoy the competition. Uh, it's a challenge. Sini Hooper traveled from Anaconda. Yeah. There's a bunch of old timers. A lot of them were good friends with the family. And 
so that's how, that's how I ended up meeting Jack. Jack Price's shoulder injury has him on the sidelines today, but he enjoys hosting his friends for today's matches. The Montana Horseshoe Hall of Famer built this indoor site in his garage in the early 90s, so he and his friends could practice through the winter. You had an indoor, and it was in the top of an old theater, and we'd go over there and pitch in the wintertime, but they uh, kept raising the price, uh, so they, they shut it down. And then there wasn't any in the state, so I built this. The goal of horseshoe pitching seems simple. Toss your shoes closest to the pad. The pads are 40 feet apart. And now when you get to 70, you can move up into the 30 foot. Ringers count for three points. You gotta be within six inches of the pegs to come. Yeah, and a leader won't count any more than that. At one point. One point, right? In competition, pitchers total points from throwing 40 or 50 shoes per game. And each pitcher has their own unique style. The three-pointer turn that I throw, as opposed to the flip, a lot of people throw the flip, it's easier for a lot of people. The pitchers take turns totaling up the points as they go from match to match. I don't know how some holding a hamburger, please. Only a quick lunch break at the nearby Avon Cafe for some sustenance and camaraderie slows things down. I like that we walk away friends and you compete. We compete as hard as we can, but we still walk away as friends. Pitching horseshoes runs in Simi Huber's family. Her father, Archie Delaney, was a good friend of Jack Price's and a longtime pitcher. He was a world champion twice. Um, he was well known um, all around the state, um, probably out of state, very genuine guy. When Delaney died in 2003, the family remembered his favorite sport. We just decided, you know, we were going to have him cremated, and the best place that my dad would want to be is horseshoe, horseshoe pits, you know. So we traveled around um, into places that my dad had thrown at, um, and one of the places is here, over in this pit over there. So one of the kids called and said, Dad, would like to be very near pitch. I said, oh my God, I can't do that. So I asked my group, they thought it was an honor. I said, we'll have it. So they came and had a little ceremony, and then they put her up to there. But all the time he's there, he's never known. <laughs> To honor her father, Huber took up the sport and is now throwing ringers in that same pit. I am happy that I'm able to follow in his horseshoe footsteps. Um, I think he'd be proud. These horseshoe pitchers say they're getting older and hope to see younger folks taking up the sport. Membership has gone down in horseshoe pitching. There are not enough younger people starting. And I see, you know, the elders are passing on away, and so I'm just not seeing a lot of juniors coming in. It's not an easy uh, game to be proficient at, I think, mean, one thing. It would have hurt to have people come and join it because it's not expensive and it's uh, made a lot of those people. Okay, so yeah, at the end of the day, the scores are totaled and trophies are awarded to the winners. But it's the friends <laughs> and family and ringers that keep bringing folks back to Avon and Jackson Door. Well, they're making it good people, I think. And, 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 and the competition draws you pretty good too, you know. And you might go home and practice a little bit. So it was a really fun story to try and tell, um, especially with that little twist, but uh, trying to stay out of the way of those <laughs> horseshoes. Uh, you try to keep one eye open all the time to make sure that nothing's coming at you. And um, in between, of course, it was you know where he parked his car during the regular time. So uh, there were some times when some people wouldn't uh, exactly let go at the right time, and they would go flying across the, uh, the floor. and. Uh, make quite a clatter, so. Any questions? 
I'm sure we'll have still doing it, right? I believe they're still doing it, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if they're always at Jack's, but they, they uh, have a Facebook site that the uh, State Horseshoe Pitching Group has, so you can get online and see when their next competition is and where the state tournament was. I think they had it in Anaconda this past year, so, yeah. Is Jack still living? I'm not exactly sure. Jack sent me a few things just a couple years ago, but I haven't checked in on him here the, uh, since the pandemic, really, so, yeah. Me personally? Well, uh, I think Gus and William and I, I don't think John was on that shoot. We were down in the uh, Centennial Valley and we got up very, very early on a cold morning in West, <laughs> West Yellowstone. This is the only injury story I can think of. And uh, we were walking into some of the lakes down there. To, I can't even remember what we were shooting, but uh, uh, we were walking on this muck and um, all of a sudden I just got sucked in up to my waist. And uh, Gus looked back at me and kept going. <laughs> I mean, what could I do? <laughs> <laughs> William handed me the tripod and try, at least tried to pull me out, but uh, that's as close to an injury as I ever had. There was a time had. I put my head in the ceiling, man. Well, that, yeah, Gus had one, yeah. Why don't you, you can take the next one here then. So tell that story and then you can. In my next? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Do you want to hear the ceiling fan story first or last? Uh, I, for a while, uh, I, did, I liked doing this thing where if I was in a, in a room, an older museum or, or room with a, the old ceiling fans, I would like to get a ladder and get above the fan and then shoot the action going on with the ceiling fan in the middle ground. You know, it was very, very artsy, very atmospheric. And I had, a, I had an intern with me who was a student. What was his name, right? I think Aaron Klingingsmith. Aaron Smith, yeah. Who's now president of like... Junior college. Yeah, junior college. Anywho. Um, I wanted to test it out first, and they had a picnic table. By the way, they were serving pie in this, in this room. All these ladies were serving homemade pie to families and stuff. And I wanted to test it out first, so I found a small footstool, and I put that on top of a picnic table. And I wasn't, I was just going to see how high I could get. I wasn't paying attention to the ceiling fan. And it was one of those big ones, you know, if, you, if it was stopped, the the, the fan blades would weight down from their own weight. And it hit me right here. And, you know, I saw orange. And, and I was able to scramble down from my perch. But this chunk of my scalp went flying across the room. These families trying to eat their pie were just completely grossed out. Blood's just streaking down my face. The intern went and grabbed a roll of paper towels and he's trying to mop me up. There was a nurse, uh, one of the ladies serving pie was a retired nurse. She took me in this room, put some ice on it to kind of stop the flow of blood. And then she took my hair and tied it in a series of knots to close the wound. And then I, I finished the shoot for the rest of the day in Phillipsburg and then when I got back to Missoula, I went to the hospital, they tore it out and put in four stitches. So. Wow. So. Oh, yeah, but here's the great thing. So I figured I'm at work, you know, I'm going to file a workman's compensation claim. <clears throat> Anybody ever done that? <laughs> the form is really simple. It said, um, how did this injury happen? And it was really simple. I said, I put my head in a ceiling fan. <laughs> And the next question was, name two things responsible for this injury. And I put, my head, a ceiling fan. So, okay, my story, toward the end of my back roads uh, career, I'm, I'm still working part-time, sort of. Um, 
I, I, I tried to do these stories that were really quintessential Montana things. I, I did a thing on the wave, people that, you know, you pass on a gravel road and you wave. Just things that, and I had called Tom Kaczynski, the reporter for the, I think he's a retired reporter for the Great Falls Tribune, and his wife and about five or four other women would meet five women from Canada and they would climb this, it's called Gold Butte. They would climb Gold Butte and I don't know, shake hands and then, and then just spend the day on top of Gold Butte, which is right on the Canadian US border. And I, was, I called him up, but this was right when COVID hit. And he was like, they're not gonna do it until this whole COVID thing goes away. And he said, man, besides you're gonna need the landowner's permission. And he said, you're not gonna wanna go up there if there's the least amount of moisture on that road because of gumbo. And then I started thinking, gumbo, gumbo, gumbo. So you're about to see a gumbo piece. And then afterwards, I'll tell you three things about it that weren't in the story. Calling it mud is only half right. This is gumbo. Dried out, gumbo is as heavy as concrete and just as hard. But that can change in an instant. And like anything instant, you just add water. <laughs> Boy, gumbo is, uh, it'd be like if you took a hockey rink and covered it in axe grease. Driving on, uh, on gumbo, you feel like it's, you're like a pig on roller skates or something. You know, every other vehicle feels like it's going a different direction. Locals call that kind of driving prairie surfing. And they've been riding those waves for years. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Frank MacArthur. Mud was so thick on the pickup and plugged in the fenders there, and he couldn't go. And he stopped there. And pickup wasn't, but maybe six months old. He had to chop the fenders off to bust them off and got them laying there in the ditch. And went on and kept on coming back into town. Mud flew all over, but he made it. Slogging through gumbo has been going on forever. The Northern Cheyenne included it in their sign talk. And in 1805, Meriwether Lewis entered this in his journal. I attempted to walk on shore, soon found it very laborious as the mud stuck to my moccasins and was very slippery. Walking in it, you'll, you'll often uh, grow four or six inches in height. <laughs> and along with height, there's a significant weight gain. The Range Riders Museum in Mile City features this 80-pound ball of gumbo that formed around the cow's foot. Even larger things that never get stuck in regular mud fall victim to gumbo. Like this tractor that got stuck pulling out this excavator, that got stuck pulling out this sprayer. So how can gumbo be so slippery and sticky at the same time? If it weren't for a rock called bentonite, and the principal clay mineral that's in bentonite, something called montmorillonite, there would be no such thing as gumbo. And gumbo has to have a certain level of montmorillonite or it's not going to exhibit the properties that we all really dislike. <laughs> Dinosaurs were the first to dislike bentonite. 100 million years ago, it rained down on them in the form of ash from volcanoes in Idaho. That ash drifted east, settling on the bed of a vast inland sea. Eons later, the sea retreated leaving extensive sedimentary clay deposits that stretched through seven states. The first was discovered near Fort Benton, hence its name, Bentonite. It is called the clay of a thousand uses, and there's a lot more than that. You'll find Bentonite in everything from cosmetics to crayons, spark plugs to stucco. 80% of the Bentonite produced is used for foundry sand, in oil and gas drilling, and... It is clumping cat. That night, when it comes in contact with water, absorbs the water, pulls it in through a chemical reaction. And in the process of doing that, it swells, and swells significantly. This shows why gumbo in Montana 
is a real nasty thing to have if you're out in the field. Several years ago, it was late in the fall, and a uh, FedEx guy was out northeast up these couple of roads, and he slid off the road, and we had to pull him probably an hour and a half up to gravel. His FedEx van was so covered in mud, it was just completely brown. It looked like a UPS van. Then. <laughs> Most folks in central and eastern Montana have at least one good gumbo story to tell. But few are more sobering than the one recounted by Judy Blunt in her memoir, Breaking Clean. <coughs> it had been raining all day. That night, Judy and her husband, John, desperately needed to get their infant daughter to the hospital, an hour's drive over gumbo roads. Tonight, the road would not be greasy. Tonight would be tough roads, somewhere between damn tough and pretty damn tough, like driving on a 12-inch layer of cold lard. A trip would mean nearly 50 miles of grinding and sliding, fighting the wheel to keep the side-to-side -side slew within the narrow range of road top. With the window rolled down a few inches, I opened Jeanette's blanket to let the damp chill fan the heat from her face as we pulled away, lurching in mud slinging rhythm to the right, to the left, to the right. Cornering from our lane onto the raised county road, the tires growled against the fender wells, kicking out boulders of packed gumbo. Dried in the sun, they could tear out an oil pan. I leaned my face against the door into the breeze that smelled of wet roots and sweet grass of spring. Thankfully, Judy's daughter survived. But should you have a serious tangle with gumbo, and when either direction seems like the wrong choice, be cautious and willing to change your travel plans. On the other side of the river, at the top of the hill, there's a sign that says the Invasco went wet. We had two people they ignore the sign, slide off, and they walked uh, four and a half miles to get to here. And I asked them both why, why they didn't stop, and they said, well, the road was really good where that sign was. And I said, that's the point. You still have time to turn around. <laughs> so, until that sloppy road firms up and the gray sky clears, here's mud in your eye. <laughs> William's telling a great little story there in the tag, which was... I grew up in Weibo, um, and gumbo was everywhere. And in high school, we had driver's ed, <clears throat> and we took out north of Weibo, and it had rained, and got onto gumbo. And the instructor turned to me and he said, "Whatever you do, don't stop." <laughs> Good advice. So uh, there were three things about that story that didn't make it. You know, we're all—we've we, only got seven minutes of the, our longest stories. Uh, the first one, the, the fellow that was out by the big tire pile talking about the guy that tore his fenders off, that was early in the morning in Roy, Montana. It's the only business in town. It's a little service station. And all the farmers and ranchers meet there first thing in the morning. Coffee's free. They sit around the fire and they talk about things. I had walked in and I was... When I buy socks, I just buy all new socks. And that way you don't have to match them. Um, and I had on this pair of white socks that were brand new. And when I walked in there, that Gary guy goes, oh, look at those white socks. And all the farmers and ranchers got a good laugh. So I knew I was in good with those guys. Uh, the ferry captain at the end on the McClellan Ferry, one thing that didn't make it in the piece, he talked about the couple that went beyond the sign and got stuck, and they walked out four and a half miles. They were both 85 years old. So that was, that was, and I, I didn't put that in the piece. Um, what was the other one? Uh, oh, yeah. The FedEx story, because I'm limited for time, the, the real, good punchline I couldn't put in for two reasons. I, I ran I ran long and I didn't want to say anything bad about FedEx, 
But when the guy was telling his story, and by the way, this was, this was late in the afternoon. It, we're in Winnet, and no, Winifred. We're in Winifred, and all these guys are in this part shop. And they're doing the same thing that, that the other guys were doing in the morning. They're just sitting around shooting the breeze. And we got him to tell that story, and he said, you know, by the time they pulled his truck out, his FedEx truck, it was so brown, it looked like a UPS truck. And he said, the, the last part of the, the, the gag was, the driver was so appreciative, he got our names and our addresses, and he said, I'm gonna send you something. And one of them said, don't send it FedEx. <laughs> So that didn't make it. Any, oh, well, there's one more good thing about that story. Judy Blunt, the, the author that, that, that read the passage about her daughter, we had this camera that was going bad. Uh, the internal battery was getting old or something, and it would always give you these warning signs. But it did that for like six months, right, John? <laughs> You know, so you just ignored it. Well, I got to her house, set everything up, turned on the camera, got the red warning light, said, okay, that's great, and then it quit. And that was it. I mean, it's never come back to life again, has it? No, it's still dead. <laughs> so here's, and she was so gracious, uh, you know, I had to phone the broadcast media center and have someone bring an additional camera back and she was busy making a raspberry cobbler and but she was really gracious about the whole thing so need to mention that any any questions about gumbo <laughs> all righty <laughs> So that leads into some insight as far as the uh, Backroads meeting, because as you can tell, there's just comedy gold everywhere you look. <laughs> and so we have this incessant fighting back and forth. I, 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 need, I need more time. I gotta have more time for my story. No, less time for your story. I need more time for my story. We actually at one point had to institute a rule. You can't go longer than this, because many times Gus Chambers would return from the road and go, this is a half hour special. <laughs> I can't, I can't do this in six or seven minutes. This is half hour special. And a lot of times he, he has a pretty persuasive argument because he does have a lot of really good material. Um, for the story that I was going to share, uh, a lot of what we talk about, I think there are a lot of interesting places and parts and pieces, but it always comes back to the people and you're drawn in by the people. Well, this was, I would have to say, one of the more amazing people uh, that I had met. I had heard about it, as we often do, where you're on another trip and somebody says, you need to meet this guy and you need to do a story about this guy. And you almost don't believe it when they're like, yeah, this, there's a guy, he's 99 years old and he's still uh, playing taps. And so that, that was a story where I said, I have to do that. And, and uh, and not to say anything at Ray's expense, but there is a sense of urgency when they tell you that he's 99 years old. It's not the kind of story you can procrastinate. So made a beeline to go up to Shelby to visit with Ray, and then uh, I can talk a little bit about some things that, that happened with Ray during the making of this that will, well, it frightened me, but hopefully it won't, it won't frighten you. So we'll do that. When his first notes are played, it stirs an emotional reaction. We met a man in Shelby who has forged a rare connection to this tune that doesn't always signal an ending. There are only 24 notes. How to describe that feeling is uh, uh, difficult at best done for the day, but remembered forever. It's the end of the celebration of the life. Well, it's the last ritual to show the appreciation for the service that they've done. 99-year-old Ray Zell knows all about service and taps 
and the significance of both. In a time where more and more digital recordings are used at ceremonies, Ray remains the real deal. It's not official, but he's believed to be the oldest veteran still playing taps at military funerals. We're just saying that he is, but nobody's proved us different. So I, I mean, 99 and a half, there can't be too many people standing up blowing a bill yet, you know. He's actually blowing a trumpet, but Ray's never been conventional. It's evident in how his story begins and how it will end. Ray Zell was born in 1915 on a homestead outside Shelby. He enjoyed music and played trumpet in the school band. It was an interesting time. Prohibition was ending. The Great Depression dragged on. But Ray and his brother still found a way to have a good time. I'll be having fun. I'd like to live some of them days over again. <laughs> And a few I didn't want to live up. Ray was in his mid-twenties by the time the U.S. entered World War II, and he enlisted. He was part of the last group to receive cavalry training. And while it wasn't useful in combat, it did have another benefit. The best part about it was we had a classy looking uniform. We had them boots, sweaters, champagne hats. The girls like that uniform. <laughs> it was no laughing matter when they got to France. On his first patrol as tank commander, Ray's group saw an American truck up ahead. But as it turned out, German soldiers were driving it, and they opened fire on his tank crew. And they just drilled that tank. One of them got killed by the way, and two of them died later. Then one of us picked up a little trap, and that, that was just shortly after we got the combat, we got a quick initiation. I was lucky to get out of that one. He returned from the war with a bronze star and a purple heart to a piece of land south of Shelby. He raised grain on that land and four children. In the 1970s, Ray was an active VFW member when the man who played taps ran into a bit of a problem. He went to play taps and then his whole false teeth wouldn't work and pull that trumpet back against the teeth by the teeth of the slip, but he couldn't do any more fancy equipment. Ray grabbed this case with his grandson's old king trumpet and reported for duty. It's working. <laughs> he began playing for military funerals and ceremonies any time he was asked. A military funeral is really good without tax playing. He played, rain or shine, hot or cold, but as he got older and struggled to play the tune, he thought about stopping. I remember Dad telling me that he was going to quit playing taps, and then he found out that they were using a recording, and decided that even if he played a wrong note or two, he was going to do it anyway, because that's what was deserved. And so Ray kept going. At age 99, he drives himself to the ceremonies. Everyone in the area expects to see him. Well, carry on. You do a marvelous job. It's getting tougher. Ray can't stay on his feet for the entire ceremony. But when it's his time, he stands and delivers. They are imperfect notes to form the perfect tribute to his fellow veterans. Ray's version of Taps. There was one of them had a little flaw here and there. And when I played my nature, I had a few flaws of my nature in my life, so I had to express myself on that trumpet. <laughs> had a little flaw once in a while. And I even heard so many wrong notes. <laughs> but we all smile at that because that's not what's important. What's important is that he feels and he stands tall and plays taps for these, for these veterans. Oh boy. Yeah, I've been around for a while, they said, yeah, it's for you. I said, I can go down and say hello. Everybody knows who he is in town. We love you, guy. Thank you. At some point, it will be Ray's time. And the man who's been a part of so many ceremonies says he doesn't want one. Well, I decided I wasn't going to have a funeral. 
Ray has a different idea. He's taking his daughter back to the old farm south of Shelby. He mentioned to me the last time we were out at a point in the land, he said, well, maybe we don't want to bother with this. It's not an easy place to get to, but Ray wants his ashes buried on this point, just above the beautiful Marias River, facing the Rocky Mountains. He doesn't want to make a big fuss. Of course, what do they do? But I say, I don't know. Once you're gone, you're gone. You, you can't object too much. The kids say they'll keep it simple, with one notable exception. There will be somebody playing taps for dad, for sure. Some way, somehow, there will be somebody playing taps for dad. 24 notes, a fitting farewell to a man who gave that honor to so many. Now that Ray has celebrated his 100th birthday, he says he still plans to play taps as long as he's able. So Ray did make it to 100, um, and his uh, rotten kids did, in fact, have a big ceremony for him. <laughs> Uh, they had multiple people play taps, actually. They had kind of the echo version of taps uh, for it. It was, it was beautiful, and it was a big deal in Shelby uh, when Ray passed, so. Uh, an incredible person. Um, so two things as a postscript to that. Uh, one, you j it, it just doesn't dawn on you that you're with and visiting with living history at the time. So Ray takes, takes me to lunch at one point, and we're sitting there chatting, and all of a sudden I realize he's telling me actual first-person stories of Prohibition when he was like almost a teenager. And of course it was hilarious because he was like, some federal law, you, just, you could just feel the Montana thing coming out, you know? He's like, I don't know, they had some federal thing about that? Sheriff didn't care about that. We just went around the corner and did this and did that. He used to get extra money delivering papers for some of the speakeasies that he would throw an extra paper to them and they'd give him 25 and 50 cents instead of just a nickel or a dime. So just an amazing person and you're, you're just kind of absorbing it at the moment. Just at the different times when we had lunch or dinner, he told so many amazing stories. You wish uh, you know, that I'd captured more of it uh, on camera. You do get caught up in, in doing it, and that's the other part of this, is there was some point during the process of making that, and you saw a few of the shots in it, <clears throat> and it finally dawned on me as a, we're going around that as I'm laser focused with the camera, and looking in the viewfinder, and then realizing I'm letting this 99 and a half year old man drive me all over the place. <laughs> And it was scary, so in town it was okay. Like you saw that little scene where we went out to the farm and we got in that truck and we're like halfway out there and I look up at Carla, the, the daughter who's with me and she goes, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, my sister, yeah, she, she thinks that's something about the way dad drives. And I go, really? And she goes, yeah, she won't, she won't ride with him. She, <laughs> I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me that before we got in the truck? And he was not shy about the, the gas pedal. I mean, we got there in a hurry and rumbled out there onto that point. So it was fantastic just to spend all that time with him. And uh, he's got a great view now on the point of the Marias River. And uh, boy, talk about a, a life well lived. Uh, he, was, he was an amazing individual. So one of the treats of uh, getting to work on this series for sure. So. Um, I don't know if there's any questions about Ray or if anybody else wanted to add anything for that. What year was that one shot? That was in 2014. 2014, so yeah, he was just about to get to his 2015 centennial uh, when we finished that up. So, and, and it was incredible. At, at one point, I just had all of uh, his memorabilia kind of spread out on the table. Uh, and it was funny because he would just sit in the recliner over in the living room and I was over in the dining room pawing through things and then he would just kind of narrate for me. Yeah, that was from World War II and then that was back before because he, as another side note that didn't get into the story, he was a little kid and has vivid memories of the Dempsey fight that took place in Shelby. He stayed with his parents up on the hill 
and watched it from up on the hill down on the arena and his brother and his friends went down there and snuck in. Because at that point, because the attendance was so bad, they just started letting anybody in so it didn't look bad you know, because they built those giant bleachers for that heavyweight fight, the, the smallest town to ever host a, a heavyweight fight in the history of boxing. Uh, happened in Shelby, and we had a documentary about that as well, but Ray was there for that. So, uh, incredible, incredible guy, that's for sure. Can you cite the years that all four of those were done, uh, well, the other three? So, uh, Gumbo was just a couple of years ago, right? That was like... 2018, 2019? Yeah, so that, that was Gumbo. I want to say it was 95, maybe, 1995 with Gene. Uh, Robel, and then when were horseshoes, Ray? You're on the spot for that. I think 15, 16, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, it's been quite the, quite the span. That's the other thing, I guess, I would add that in, since uh, we always cringe when we throw your round numbers thing in there, because it just sounds like we're such slugs. <laughs> Jeez. Can't you guys come up with more in 30 years and 50 shows? Come on. So I'll tell you that. This is an internal argument that's going on within Montana PBS and the Broadcast Media Center or whatever, which is we have this show, this amazing show, which is really the most popular local show that we have on Montana PBS by far. You would think that would be the number one priority, but it hasn't been. Like We're always working on these other larger documentaries, and in our spare time, we'll go out and work on Backroads, which... You, I can see you nodding your heads. It's idiotic. I know. You should, why, why are you working on back rows and doing a lot of those and then do the documentaries on the side of that? And we just, we started it that way and then it just, apparently we're not good with change because we never, <laughs> we never changed that. So, so we're doing our best to try and do more. Uh, we'll say that. I was curious, the ones that you featured here, are those like your personal favorite shows or were there others that were your favorites? <laughs> Okay, anybody want to jump in for, for favorites? I, I, I don't think people necessarily picked their favorites for this one. I think we were just trying to kind of guess maybe ones that people hadn't seen or, or something that we had a behind the scenes story with. So I don't know if they're I mean, it, personal favorites. Yeah, it's really hard because there have been so many over the years and there's just been so many people that you've met. It's, it's hard to say for me, which one is my favorite? I know William probably has one because we were in his hometown, so. Yeah, certainly that was one of my favorites, but I think other than the Gene Robel piece, my favorite story I think is the one we did in Polaris at the Polar Bar because it was, we kind of came around a corner and found the place, although we'd heard about it. And so Gus and I went back to do the story there and Walt Melcher who was running it I think maybe six months to a year after that, somebody came in and sort of bought off his liquor license for a song, and the whole thing kind of stopped. But it was such a, a, a community resource for folks, and, so, and Walt was such a special guy, and Gus did such a great job of telling that story that that still remains, to me, really the essence of what Backroads has been. And for me, as the host of the show for all those years, to be able to tell the stories that these guys put together was probably the best part of my career uh, on television from Montana PBS. Because as you can see, they have the ability to tell a story about horseshoes that ends up about a family's dedication um, and the, the inside story that his ashes are in the pit, um, or John's story about Ray Zell, which is just so touching and you know that we were able to update that when he died and that yes he is on that point above the Marias River and Gus's ability to get people to come up with just the perfect one liner to uh, make the stories. So I coach him. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say this? Um, that's been the, the best part of, of my career and happy to turn, turn it over to John because I know that Backroads will continue to uh, thrive and get better, and I'll be there in reruns until the sun explodes. So um, <laughs> they're timeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, they're they're great Montana stories. And when John talks about doing documentaries or doing Backroads, 
I always said that Montana PBS has to prove to Montanans that we are worthy of their state support and their individual contributions. And, you know, CNN and other channels are not going to tell Montana stories, except the ones we don't want them to, <laughs> to, to tell. Um, that's up to us. And the response has been really remarkable from folks. And th to have the talent that we have there now is, you know, we're all lucky that we can produce that kind of television. I need to do this. Thank you. None of you should retire. <laughs> I, I'm there on, you know, the, the fundraiser ones. I'll come in the studio and ask you to send in money, but... <laughs> oh, well, first off, thank you for the show. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, as someone somewhat new to Montana, it's been a great way to get to know the state and uh, hear some of the stories behind the stories. Um, I'm just curious, have you ever done a story about Traveler's Rest here? Or is that in, even a possibility? Stand-ups. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did we do stand-ups? Mm -mm. No. We have, it, no. It seems like we've done something here. No. Thank you for the embarrassing question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. It's, uh, I will say that yeah, we have this kind of uh, weird thing about anything that's close to us for some reason. I think we, yeah. we, we've been reluctant. Uh, I think we feel like we're going to get labeled that we're favoring Missoula and Western Montana and that sort of thing. But I think it's an excellent suggestion. And obviously, there's a huge amount of material and story and interest that could go with it in history. So I mean, it's, it's definitely a possibility. But I know that when we've had discussions before, we're always hypersensitive about making sure we're getting the whole state in. And so, so some nearby places probably suffer because of that. And we have told so many stories from so many state parks as well around the state, so it's, But this yeah. is the best one. Yeah. <laughs> Without See? a doubt. Yeah. Well, they right. won't be on the list now. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Do you have any idea as to how many episodes you're going to be doing per year now? Well, we're at, we're at least trying to, again, these numbers are embarrassing to talk about, but we're at least trying to bump it up to where we can get three a year, because we were at two, sometimes it trickled down to one uh, during those horrible political years where we had to cover that stuff. Talk about just two extremes. If, I, if there's somebody who goes through that, the best part of the job of working on back roads and then political coverage. <laughs> Yeah. As I like to say, it's the only two things together that I need to wear muck boots for both of them. <laughs> <laughs> One other comment. Uh, I was here, I don't know how many years ago it was now when you were all here before, and I am really glad you came back to get all these people that weren't here last time into the story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we're, we're, we have new programs that premiere in May. September and November, and then we have our normal Saturday at 5.30, um, five. or five o'clock, sorry, time slot each week as well, where we rerun the program, so. And then you can go online, montanapbs.org, or do the PBS Passport app, and you can watch all of the previous episodes. Back to episode number one. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. <laughs> I, I did leave some, uh, some little literature in the back and some um, uh, license plate covers and some stickers. If you guys want, please feel free to take whatever. So. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Next time you come, will you bring the fellow that sings the song? <laughs> Good idea. We should bring a musician. Great yeah. idea. <laughs> that's, that's Bruce Anfinson. Yes, that's not extra. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, please do take some swag. I'm going to just give a shout out to Montana PBS. And um, I have discovered this year as uh, 
a PBS junkie and now a supporter of it, that PBS passport is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. So um, spread your philanthropy around. Give here, give there. Um, and, and speaking of giving, I did want to say too that we have the sign-up sheet for our treat table. There are lots of goodies there, so please take one for the road. And if you feel so inclined that you would like to help stock that table for any future storytellings. We'll have the sign-up sheet out there, and you can bring treats on the next time. Um, thanks again, everybody. Thanks to, for the patience of our friends on Zoom. We really appreciate you. And we'll see you next week with Shirley Trahan, who is an elder and a member of the Salish Kalis Bay Culture Committee, who's going to be sharing traditional stories with us. All right? Thanks, everybody.